faster to make us sleep better. We need to um, make sure that we could measure, um, measure, measure the, uh, the outcome of this, whether saving money or reducing risk. So look at uh, internet users distribution in the world for this is for 2021 only uh, less than 7% of the world's internet users are actually in North America. Um, surprisingly enough, and most of them are in Asia, Europe, Africa. Uh, so consequently, uh, most of the crime that we're uh, being targeted with also comes from, yeah, and, and conversely, even though only 7% of the world's internet users are in North America, 93% of the attacks are on North America. There's a, there's a lot of reasons for this, uh, economic reasons, geopolitical reasons, legal reasons. Um, and these these outfits know exactly what they're doing. Just to kind of put this in perspective, th this is an interesting thing to think about. Think about, um, you know, for all of its other failings, the uh, communist bloc had very good education in STEM, right? Science, technology, engineering, and math. And that's still true about Russia today and a lot of, a lot of Eastern Europe. Their STEM education is very good. You know, these kids are doing trigonometry in seventh grade. So I think that's one of the reasons why I have as much trouble as we do coming from that part of the world is you have people that are smart and capable and they have good education in what we now call STEM. They have a lack of economic opportunity. The laws aren't well enforced over there. So they set up these crime workshops and then they target, you know, the West um, and they're, you know, kind of looking to, to steal money. So this is our agenda. Uh, we're going to talk about SMBs and law firms, uh, law firm security concerns uh, and law firms obviously have a lot of uh, a lot of confidential data that's very important that needs to be protected. We're going to talk about what a SIEM does and why you need it. We'll talk about compliance a little bit, which is something that obviously the legal space is going to be thinking a lot about. And then uh, we'll have a couple of minutes for closing remark and, and uh, Q and A. So all organizations are being targeted by financially motivated organized crime actors, and. These organizations, they have two basic criteria for who they're targeting. Uh, do they think you have money? It doesn't even mean that you necessarily have money. And do they think they could steal it? That's it. Uh, you could be doing, you know, God's work or the devil's work or whatever. They don't care. They're completely unscrupulous for the most part. Um, while there are some exceptions, for the most part, they're simply looking to make money. Um and look at the verbiage here by organized crime actors. Do not underestimate um these crime these. Uh, these crime outfits, um, they look, smell, act, and taste just like a regular business. They're, they're going to have uh, managers and project managers, engineers, team leads, financial targets. They have a list of targets they're going to hit. They have help desks. They're going to have square footage that they rent. They do all of these things. They look exactly like an organized business. It is organized crime. They have talented people that they hire. They do spend money on, on the talent that they need. Uh, and as I mentioned before, you know, he's coming from Eastern Europe or from from Russia or from, uh, you know, North Korea or wherever they are. And what it is that they're doing is not going to be illegal necessarily where they are. Just uh, for example, there's legal prohibitions in most of what we call the developed world, the United States, Europe, uh, Japan, South, uh, South Korea, Australia. Uh, it's legal to it's illegal to hack both inside and outside their borders. That's certainly true in the United States. Um, just, you know, Russia gets picked on a lot these days, but uh, in, in Russia, it's not illegal to hack outside their borders. So you could set up an organization that's targeting Americans or Europeans and the Russian authorities aren't going to do anything about it because it's not even illegal. And they're pretty careful about keeping their targets small enough to not attract the attention from the wrong people, whether it's, you know, FBI or Interpol. And, and um, even the Russian authorities will cooperate with uh, with American authorities or British authorities, whoever, if it's in their mutual interest to do so. So here we have a slide from the 2022 uh, data breach investigation report that comes from Verizon and the 2023 DBR is out as well. And I have reviewed that. And the statistics are um, they're they're pretty much pretty much the same for the most part. Uh, the DBIR has been out every year since 2008, and this is a very widely read report in cybersecurity uh, circles. And Verizon has a large team of people and other companies that they cooperate with on to put this thing together. So according to Verizon, there are four key paths leading to the compromise of your state, and Verizon finds that it's credentials, phishing, exploit vulnerabilities, and botnets. Now, credentials, of course, are username and passwords. And I can tell you from having done penetration testing uh, as a white hat penetration tester, that's where you, you know you hire somebody like me to hack into your network and then provide a network uh, provide a report. 
um, that stealing usernames and passwords is is, a, is an easy thing to do. There's a bunch of technical ways to do this. You can use rainbow tables. You can use brute force attacks. Uh, you could steal them using phishing attacks. Uh, you can use social engineering in order to trick somebody giving up a username and a password. That's an effective way to do it, which leads us to phishing. Now, the reason the reason that they uh, phishing is so pervasive is because it works. Uh, we all get junk mail in the mail, right, uh, for oil changes or windows or whatever. And the reason that you get junk mail is because the marketing firms know that it works. This is simply a numbers game. It's the law of averages. If you send out hypothetically 30,000 of these things, maybe 300 people are going to read it and maybe 30 will convert or something like that, right? And the same, the exact same argument is basically true of phishing. And phishing is cheap to do. It's easy to do. Uh, and if you send out enough phishing emails, you're going to get some type of a conversion rate, so to speak, which means you're going to get a certain number of people to click on your email. And then out of those people that click on it, some of them are going to be unpatched, and then you're going to get toe holds in systems. So if you do this 24-7, 365 for thousands and thousands of systems, it's going to be successful. Um, the next thing is exploit vulnerabilities. And when we talk about exploit vulnerabilities, we're usually thinking in terms of some piece of malicious logic, uh, you know, virus, worm, something like that. But Exploiting a vulnerability could also be exploiting uh, a poorly trained human or a human that has an unpatched system or something like that. And the last piece here is is a botnet. And what a botnet is, uh, is a network of tens or hundreds of thousands of computers. And these could be whatever computer you could think of. And this is why hackers are interested in grandma's computer or a computer that's sitting in the back of a candy store in Podunk or whatever, uh, because you get thousands or tens of thousands of these these bots, right? And then they're connected back to uh, what's called a command and control server, a CNC server. And then you could use these uh, to attack larger, more hardened networks. Like if you want to attack a, you know, General Electric or Lockheed Martin or something like that, or just a bigger target, then you you could use a botnet to do that. Um, in military parlance, this is what we, we would call a force multiplier. Uh, and incidentally, you could go onto the dark web and you could rent botnets by the hour, sort of like a cheap motel in a bad neighborhood. And they don't care what you do with it. You know, it's an hourly rate. You rent the botnet for an hour or two hours or three hours. You do whatever you're going to do with it. And they don't they don't ask what you do with it. And they they do not care. They just collect their Bitcoin bitcoins and go about their merry way. So we're going to talk about seam, what a seam does and, and why you need it. And seam uh, is can be kind of an abstract concept. So what I have here is a couple of slides that are going to use an analogy. And I love my analogies. Those of you who've seen me present before know I love my analogies. And um, I'm going to use an analogy using building access control systems to try and explain a little bit more in layman's terms what a SIEM does. And SIEM stands for Security Information Event Monitoring. And it works by collecting log and event data generated by organizational systems. And you have all these systems on your, your IT system, your network. Uh, you have uh, computers, workstations, laptops, servers, routers, switches, intrusion detection, uh, IoT, VoIP, you name it. These things all generate system logs. Uh, and the when you have a big enough network and you start generating thousands or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of logs per day that aren't intended for humans anyway, and this information is security relevant, this isn't something you just want to leave unmonitored. Uh, and in most cases, in most networks, it is unmonitored. Now in the Department of Defense and the DOD space, we started rolling out these SIEM years and years ago. So the technology is not new, but it's just now becoming available in the SMB space at an affordable cost. Um, so there's, and why do I need it? Auditing and compliance requirements. Uh, seems the seam not only is it look at the data that as it's coming through, but it will ingest that, distill it down. It runs it through a fusion engine, and then it will save uh, the seam logs into an archive for forensics work later. Full visibility of everything happening in the network. And a seam does, as it says here, dramatically takes a, the time that it de, te, te, dramatically decreases the time that it takes to identify threats, and then detailed forensics analysis in the major in the event of major security breaches. And you may have heard the uh, the phrase dwell time. And dwell time is the amount of time between an attacker gets into a network and has a toehold in it and gets gets system access to the amount of time that uh, it takes to discover it. And it, usually that's expressed in weeks or sometimes months. And a seam dramatically reduces uh, dwell time on average. 
So, but here's here's the problem. It seems it's a complex technology and it's difficult to explain to non-technical people. So engineers, people like me, uh, seem as a critical protective and detective te critical protective and detective technology. And the CFO and the CFO is, you know, whoever is paying for it or the president or a manager or something like that, a non-technical person says, what does this even do? Because again, it's kind of abstract. And the users, uh, as far as the users go, Seam doesn't do any, it doesn't make their computer faster. It doesn't make it slower. There's no blinking lights or anything like that. It doesn't alter the user experience in any way. So the users uh, just, just aren't going to care. So I have an analogy here. Uh, how a Seam works, sort of, it's an analogy. Here's a blank map of the uh, lower US 48 states. And I've got monopoly houses here. Uh, let's imagine one office building, one business, uh, a point of presence in each of the 50 states. So we have 50 businesses. And there's a lot of businesses like this. They have one headquarter in each state or they have something in every state, right? So now let's add 100 employees for each of the states, right? So now we have 5,000 employees. We've got 100 employees in each building. And then let's give them all an access token. And the reason I'm using an access token for my analogy here is because uh, pretty much everybody that works in an office building or sits at a computer is familiar with these things. They either come in cards or fobs or whatever they are. So uh, now we have 5,000 employees carrying 5,000 access tokens going in these 50 different buildings. Okay. So let's complicate our analogy a little bit more. Let's assume 24, seven, uh, 24 by 7 by 365 operations. And the reason I do that is because most computer networks are like this. Most of the time, you don't shut them off anymore, do we? Um, they operate 24, 7, 365, which increases our, our attack surface by increasing the amount of time that uh, everything's exposed to the internet. And then let's assume kind of a highly secure environment. Maybe it's a, you know, a healthcare system or something like that. Um, where uh, the external building, the external doors are locked and then the internal doors are all locked and then where people could come and go and when is all kind of kind of segmented, right? So, uh, so you know, 50 buildings, 5,000 employees, 24 by 7, 365 operations, 100 buildings. Um, employees have role-based access control limiting where they could go and when. And in a secure environment, this is a reasonable thing. This is the principle of least average or least access and then least privilege. Uh, there's no reason for people that work in finance to be getting into engineering or vice versa. So we limit limit that access out of the principle of least privilege and least access. But the point is, is think about how much data this would generate all these people coming and going in these 50 different buildings, 50 States, 5,000 people, all the, this is a ton. What, what would you even do with that amount of data? Right. And then how often would a genuine security uh, concern arise? You have people that are doing, you know, you have authorized employees with authorized tokens doing their authorized jobs, but that doesn't mean that everything is going to be dressed, right. Dressed. There could be problems. Um, so uh, you know, can we just have humans monitor all this? No, the answer is definitely not. And here we have a picture of a security operations center. We just can't have a bunch of humans sitting there looking at logs whizzing by. You won't be able to make heads or tails of that. There will be so much data going by, you won't even know what to do with it. So this is um, uh, uh, where a correlation engine comes in and where a fusion engine comes in. Uh, whether it's SIEM or building access control system, the, the, the data is just not structured to be human friendly, by the way. So you need uh, a SIEM to distill all this stuff down. So when, and the analogy I'm, try, I'm making here is that all this data that these people coming and going is similar to all the data that uh, you know, computers are creating. And, it, and to humans, it's not interesting at all. And it's not human, it's something that humans can really watch. So uh, here's, here's uh, this is my kid's rabbit Dumbo, by the way, but, um, let's say Dumbo is, uh, he's a, a custodian and he cleans floors at ABC corporation. Right. Um, incidentally, think about this. I worked in the classified realm for a lot of years and I would only have access to build parts of the buildings, which were required for myself to do my job, build principle of least access and least privilege, but, uh, custodians, they have to have access to everything, don't they? They clean the entire building, they clean the bathrooms, they complete all the compartmented areas, so uh, even the custodians in those environments are people that would have top secret clearances with the appropriate clearances, or you would have somebody that did have the clearance, follow them around all the time. And um, I had to do babysitting service fairly often. You would have people come in that weren't cleared. So you'd have to literally follow them around all day, which is just kind of a pain. Uh, but in any case, 
let's imagine that Dumbo is in a building in Texas and he's doing his job, right? He's in there sweeping the floor, but then all of a sudden uh, somebody has cloned Dumbo's fob and they try to use it to access a building in California. This is what we would call an anomaly, right? This is not something that should be happening. And if you have humans trying to watch the logs, there's no way they would ever pick up on this. You need a correlation engine or a fusion engine to do this. Um, or let's assume that, you know, let's assume that Bum Dumbo automatically, uh, 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 accidentally tries to badge into the same door, uh, badge into some door sometime by accident. That's just one time. It's not that big deal. You know, um, I've done that accidentally tried to, you know, scan into a door that I wasn't access to, but what if he, what if Dumbo did this every single day at five, you know, every single day, five days straight, and he's trying to get into this room that he doesn't belong into. Maybe that's an anomaly that might require attention. You need a computer to pick up on that. Or what if Dumbo's coming in to work uh, at odd hours, something like that? So there's a bunch of different anomalies that could be picked up on in a system like this. And this is exactly what Seam does. Let's hypothetically say that somebody has broken into your system and they're trying to create a domain admin account at two o'clock in the morning on Christmas. This is something we want to know about. Or somebody has changed a password 20 times in four minutes. That's something we know about. And these are all, these are anomalies. Uh, that humans are not going to see, but there are things that should be up-channeled so that a human could take uh, take a look at this and see what's actually going on. So uh, how a seam works. So a seam can ingest logs from different things. It comes from the SOC, from web applications, uh, applications in the marketplace, work from home employees, cloud integrations, workstations and server network devices, seam sensors. So it sends all these alerts and logs and notifications into the central correlation engine, uh, which in this case, uh, in the, if you're uh, buying the seam services from innovative computing systems, then this seam is uh, going to be monitored by a security operations center that operates 24-7, 365. There's 160 people in it. Um, this is uh, kind of like a Think about NORAD, right? Uh, the Air and Space Defense, North American Air and Space Defense. You have a bunch of people, a bunch of humans sitting in an operations center um, looking at screens, looking for incoming threats, right? So when you have a threat, you have a human that knows, uh, that can make a decision whether or not to do anything about that. So that's kind of in a high level what a SEAM does. And we're starting to see more and more that um, professional services companies like law firms and CPAs and those sorts of things are being uh, required in their respective verticals. I know the American Bar Association talks about this kind of stuff. Um, and I've personally been to the ABA tech show twice where I was teaching CPEs to lawyers. And I don't remember if we talked about SEAM at that time, but, uh, and we also see it being pushed down by uh, insurance carriers. There are you know, when you're looking to cybersecurity insurance, the insurance carriers are asking, do you have SIEM, do you have EDR, do you have multi-factor authentication? And these are all questions that innovated, innovative computing systems can help you help you with. So if you have any questions about cybersecurity insurance, the questionnaire, if you receive one of these things and there's a question on there you don't understand or you don't know if you have something, then uh, get a hold of innovative computing systems and they can help you with this. This particular slide talks about uh, the ConnectWise Cyber Research Unit, and these slides will be in the handouts. I, uh, I've sent them out in advance in PDF, and uh, anybody here can have a copy of those. But um, ConnectWise, uh, we probably have more intelligence about the small to mid-sized business community than any, any other business on the planet, because that's who primarily we serve, and we do a lot of security work for them. Um, SEAM and MDR can uh, help you with various compliance requirements. And here I have a couple of things up that you may be familiar with. Uh, uh, if you work in the legal space, you've definitely heard of HIPAA, maybe, maybe, maybe Jill, but definitely contractual requirements, SOX, probably uh, the CMMC is a cybersecurity maturity model certification. That's something that I worked on with the defense industrial base a lot. Um, other things are considered policies, acceptable use policy, bring your own device policies, important cloud policy, work from home policy, encryption. Uh, and then process and technology are also parts of uh, your cybersecurity program, incident response plan, uh, business continuity and disaster recovery, important change management. Uh, we don't want ad hoc change management. ROI is important re return on investment. We don't do all of these things just to make ourselves sleep better. We need to be able to show that we're reducing our business risk or saving money in some quantifiable way using qualitative or quantitative metrics. Um, oftentimes in money or man hours saved or something like that. And on, on the last column here, we have some of the technology, uh, multi-factor authentication, EDR, seam backups, network flow, so on and so forth. Um, are there any questions before we get on to our last slide here? Let's 
Let's see, I'm trying to. And if we don't have any questions, then I'll have to hand it back off to you, Ted. Well, great, Jason. That was that was deep. That was uh, that was extremely well done. I appreciate that. Um, no questions in the chat? Then you know, by all means, uh, feel free to reach out to us or to Jason. All of our information will be provided to you. Um, we I see we've got uh, just enough. Just enough attendees, we can uh, offer a security review for, for all of you. So we will reach out to you uh, after the recording is, is complete. And if there's nothing else, again, Jason, thank you for your time. Uh, did you have anything to add? No, no, I enjoy doing these. You know. Good deal. Thank you all for taking the time. We'll make sure you get a copy of the recording. And uh, to the challenges of the legal field, um, you know, faces with cybersecurity, but there's their clients are all over the place. They're kind of like uh, MSPs in the respect that their clients could be anything and everything under the sun. You just never know. It's it's amazing um, what kind of businesses are out there that do all kinds of oddball, interesting niche things. Well, um, and so and that comes with challenges. Our law, law firms represent banks, represent uh, politicians, represent yeah. um, Hollywood studios, uh, you know, just the whole gamut. So there's no there's no one size fits all. So when it comes to these complicated IT and cybersecurity program uh, problems, that's why they would come in and, and partner with uh, a partner with Innovative ICS. Absolutely. Well, again, everyone, thank you for your time. Look forward to sending you the recording, and uh, your account executive will follow up with you directly. Uh, I see uh, we've got several clients on the call, so thanks for taking the time to join us. And again, thank you, Jason. Y'all have a great. Day. Thank you. See you again. Bye, Bye now.